what would happen if an unstoppable force met an immovable object? Have you ever heard that question posed? What would happen if an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? Well, one author and physicist suggested that actually the immovable object wins because if it slows down the unstoppable force at all or brings it to a halt, then it won, that it is in fact the winner. And I have often thought about that, but I don't lose enough sleep over it to really be concerned by it. Do you? That was a question, and I'm not really sure if you... Do we need to circle back around? Are you confused? Okay, good. We're on the same page. Well, I say that to say we're, we're going to be reminded of a truth today, and, and the truth is this. The gospel is unstoppable. We have seen it explode in the book of Acts from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And you're going to see today again just a beautiful picture of how the gospel is unstoppable. Spurgeon, a, a theologian, said it this way. He said, the gospel is like a caged lion. We, we don't need to defend it. We just need to let it out. <laughs> Because God's word does not return void. It is alive. It is active. It is powerful. And the gospel, the good news of Jesus, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension is unstoppable. And it is exploding in the book of Acts that we have been studying. And we have found ourselves in chapter 16, which is on Paul's second missionary journey. And last week, if you remember, we started... Acts 16, and here's what we looked at in Paul's missionary journey. We saw how a group of believers scattered because of persecution went from Jerusalem, planted a church in Antioch. That was the hub for Paul's missionary journeys. He's already taken one. Now he's taken a second one, and he's going back to encourage the churches he's already planted and keep advancing the gospel. And he leaves Antioch, and he goes through Tarsus and Derby and Iconium and Lystra and somewhere in here he picks up Timothy so now it's Paul Silas and Timothy and Paul's passionate about preaching the gospel in Asia this is modern day Turkey but the Bible calls it Asia and he's wanting to get up into Bithynia and Phrygia and he's so pumped about getting the gospel there but the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him the Spirit of Jesus says no and in fact the Spirit moves him really really quickly all the way down to Troas and Paul and Silas and Timothy are wondering, man, what do, we, what do we do? This is our mission. We want to be an Asian. God is saying no. And while waiting in Troas, he gets a vision of a Macedonian man who's saying, hey, come preach the gospel to us. And so Paul and Silas and Timothy immediately leave Troas and set sail for Macedonia, which is Philippi. And that's where we pick up our story today. And this, this moment in time, it's incredibly profound. Maybe, maybe the most profound moment since Pentecost in Acts 2, because this is the moment when the gospel comes to Europe. This is modern day Greece. This is the moment where the gospel is literally at the ends of the earth. And we can trace what's happening here Back to that moment. So we're here today because Paul and them first took the gospel there. And so from there, it's now made its way here and around the world. And what you're going to see, not only in his missionary journeys, but in the people that Paul encounters there, is that the gospel is unstoppable. And so, Lord, today we, we love you, we believe in you, and we are anchored, rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is unstoppable. Thank you both for saving us and for sending us into your mission in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. So grab your Acts Scripture Journal, flip to Acts 16. We're going to pick up in verse 11. And I'm going to tell you a lot of this story today, but I want you to have your Bible open and follow along. And I will specifically read some of the verses, but from verse 11 down towards the end of chapter 16, I just want to tell you this story because Luke is a magnificent writer and there's this incredible arc and story being written here. And so as they enter into Macedonia, they're actually in Philippi. And Paul and his boys, they're out and about on the Sabbath, and they're looking for a place of prayer. That's 
People who would be gathered for worship on the Sabbath. This was Paul's custom, and he would start preaching there. And in verse 14, instead of finding what he imagined, he happens upon a women's prayer meeting, and you meet this woman named Lydia. And Lydia is really fascinating because Lydia, the Bible says, is from Thyatira. Now check this. That's actually in Asia, the place that Paul had been so desperate to preach all along. But, but she's actually in Philippi. And the Bible tells us she's a merchant. She's a seller of purple goods, which means she's probably very, very wealthy. And Philippi is perhaps the location of where she is on business. It's a major trade route. And it says that she is with these women at a prayer meeting, and she's a God-fearer, which means that she had interest in the Jewish scriptures and the God of the Jewish Bible. So she's observing the Sabbath. She's seeking truth. Truth, and she's gathered with these other women praying and studying the scriptures. And Paul just walks in and interrupts them. And I'm not sure why they let him interrupt or what prompted him to have that much courage or conviction, but he just stumbles in. He's like, hey, can I interrupt y'all for a minute? And they allow him to speak. Now, now, maybe he shared his knowledge of the Jewish scriptures. Maybe he heard what they were praying for and offered some insight into the character of God. We're not exactly sure, but Paul enters in and he begins to unpack the scriptures. And my assumption is, is Paul is teaching them the fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures that they're studying. He's teaching them about the Messiah, Jesus, that the Jewish scriptures point to. And I don't know, but maybe he leans over to Lydia and he says, everything that that Old Testament places on you, you're never going to be able to keep the restrictions and the rules and you're always going to fail. But, but that's the point because you need a savior. And then I love what happens in verse 14. Look at this. Speaking of Lydia, it says the Lord did what? We can't save people, church. We're faithful with the gospel, and God must open hearts. But the gospel is unstoppable. And so the Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. And after she and her household were baptized, look, and look she urged us, Paul, Timothy, Silas, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. And so Lydia this woman, this merchant, this wealthy woman immediately believes and her entire household gets saved and then baptized. And then she invites Paul into her home. And she is the first recorded believer in Philippi, in Greece. And the church most likely was launched and planted right there in her home. And I bet it was a nice home. Probably had a hot tub, a view of the mountains. She probably pro rolled in a really nice chariot, had a three-camel garage. I bet it was nice. She's this wealthy merchant. But she, as wealthy as she was, she still was looking for answers to something in her soul that was missing. And so no matter what resource she had as this wealthy woman, there was something that had yet to fully satisfy her. And Paul shows up and preaches the gospel, and the gospel immediately pierces her heart, and she believes. And Paul says, man, you got a lot of treasure, I assume, but there's, there's one true treasure of heaven, and his name is Jesus. And so Lydia now sees Jesus as more beautiful than anything else. And so now all of her resource and her home and her belongings, like, hey, come here. And most believe this is, this is where the church at Philippi was planted, so so all of her wealth is now being directed towards the kingdom of God. And in this moment, the gospel is introduced to Europe. And you may think, man, is it going to thrive in another culture? Are they going to be able to embrace it? Are they going to be able to multiply it? Well, as you keep reading in Acts, the gospel is unstoppable. It saturates all of Europe. And listen, 2,000 years later, we're here. Amen? Amen. It's unstoppable. So I love the story of Lydia. But if you keep looking down... Luke is a master writer because he introduces you to the next character in verse 16, which is a slave girl who had a spirit of divination. And you're like, ooh, that sounds neat. It's not. It's a demon. <laughs> and she's not like Lydia. She's not in a position of wealth or control. In fact, she's being controlled. 
Lydia is looking for answers, and this slave girl can't even speak for herself. Paul shows up to Lydia, but, but this slave girl, she's following Paul around. She's chasing Paul around and screaming at him. They'll just read it. This is a historical moment in time. Like, be there. Put your toes in the sandy streets of Philippi. I don't know if they're sandy, but I imagine they're sandy. Just be there. And, and, and look at what happens in, in verse 18 with the slave girl. Paul was greatly what? Don't you just love the honesty of the Bible? Like, we're trying to get stuff done, and this lady keeps following me around and screaming at me. Would you be annoyed? No, I'm way too holy for that. No, you're not. And turning to the Spirit, look at what Paul did. He said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he thought about it, prayed about it, Considered it res- response. Said, let me get back to you. No, no. And it came out when? Right away. Paul doesn't turn around and say, hey, here's a few things out of the Jewish scriptures I want you to know. Hey, here's an argument about the law. Here's how I, why I think Jesus is the Messiah. He doesn't, he doesn't appeal to reason. He doesn't explain the law. Just a moment of a declaration. It's how powerful the gospel is. Just in a moment, the power of Jesus frees this little girl from what's been enslaving her for who knows how long. Do you see how powerful the gospel of Jesus Christ is? There's nothing that stands in its way. Now, we don't know in the scripture if she actually becomes a part of the church, if she places her faith in Jesus Christ. Many would make a case that she's in this story because she does, and she becomes a part of the family of God, and that's why Luke's including her in the story. Now, we don't have her profession of faith, so we can't say that that's true. I believe that's what's true, but we can't confidently say, but we can confidently say that the gospel is so powerful that a word from Paul freed her from the demonic oppression like that. Now, the guy's owners, I mean, excuse me, the girl's owners are furious, (laughs) Because apparently they used to peddle her in her previous condition for their own selfish gain. And they have Paul and Silas and Timothy thrown in jail. Now what they don't know is Paul's a Roman citizen, so they have them beaten, put in stocks, and imprisoned. And so now what? Could you imagine what it would be like to want to be preaching in Asia, keep hearing no, finally get a call to go to Philippi. You go to Philippi only to find yourself in prison. You might have a bit of pout. Wouldn't you? Might want to cry and and mope just a little bit. Nobody? Come on. Anybody? God, I wanted to be in Asia. You bring me here and now you put me here in prison. Stop believing that just because you follow the Lord's will, it doesn't mean hard things won't happen. Like, who told you that? And where did you read that? Quite often, you're called to suffer right alongside what the Savior did. And so they're there. And they're in prison. And I love their response. Look at verse 25. About midnight. You know, my dad used to tell me, you know why your curfew's midnight? It's because nothing good ever happens after midnight. Come home. <laughs> but there are times in our life that feels like midnight. It's the Middle of the night, it's really dark, no one's around, it's lonely and scary, and you're going to have your midnight moment where you can't imagine you are where you are and you don't know how you're going to get past that. But, but look at Paul and Silas and Timothy. They were doing what? Praying and singing hymns to God. And what? The prisoners were listening to them. Pa- Paul and his, his crew are praying and singing songs. If we could get just a taste of that freedom and just get a taste of that joy in our heart, regardless of circumstance, that no matter where we find ourselves or what's happening, we have the ability to pray and sing. And and many have suggested Paul's probably the most frustrating man in the world to try to break down because you're like, Paul, we're going to kill you. Well, to die is gain. We'll take all your stuff. I consider it rubbish anyway. We'll beat you. You know, the sufferings of this world are just a momentary light affliction. 
We'll imprison you. Fine, I'll just lead everybody to Jesus while I'm in there. What do you do to a guy like that? See, the gospel's unstoppable in his heart and life. There's a freedom that many of you wish that you could tap into. Like know a little bit of that joy and lightness in your life. But what was happening in Paul and Silas and Timothy's life that allowed them to pray and sing in that moment wasn't a unique, like encapsulated moment in time. It's what the Spirit was doing in their heart. And that that can happen in your heart. There's a freedom in Christ that you can experience. That wasn't just a Paul and Silas and Timothy thing. That can be a you thing. Don't you want to taste some of that? Like a, a freedom in this life that's so unstoppable that there's no situation in your future or in your past that can keep you from loving and serving and praising God. And while they're praying, if you keep reading, God sends an earthquake. It's a pretty powerful prayer moment, don't you think? And all the prison doors are opened. Everyone's bonds are are unfastened and they're free to go. And don't you think in that moment that Silas and Timothy and Paul, like God answered our prayer. Like if you were in that moment in prison and earthquakes come and you're free, you're bailing, aren't you? I'm gone. As quick as I got in, I'm out if my chains are loosened like that. But if you keep reading, Paul stays put. Paul, what are you doing? You're free. But Paul stays put for a purpose because you you meet the Roman jailer. And the Roman jailer is completely different from Lydia and the slave girl. He's not wealthy like Lydia, and he's not possessed like a demon like the slave girl either. No, no, no. He's an extremely hardworking individual, probably had a fiercely committed personality. You would have to in order to have this job. And if a prisoner escapes from a Roman jail, even if it's because of an earthquake, it means death for the Roman jailer. And Paul's got a chance to bail. He's free, but remember, he's a Roman citizen, so he knows it would mean death for the Roman jailer. And Paul stays, and and I believe, it's my perspective, you can disagree and be wrong, that's fine. But but I think he's like, man, I want to give a concrete example of commitment that this jailer doesn't know anything about. And he's fiercely loyal, and he's committed, and he's the committed of the committed, but there's a loyalty to Jesus that he's yet to see. Why don't we show him? Why don't we show him? And the jailer can't get over what's happening right here in this moment. And and look back down at verse 29. It says, the jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Like, why are you still here? And, And look. So he escorted them out, and he asked this question. And this question is, the most profound question outside of who is Jesus in the Bible. This, this question, this well articulated, it is only found in a few places in the Bible. I mean, the gospel is all over the Bible, but the simplicity and focus of the Roman jailer's question should grab your attention. Like it is a pointed, clear question. You should underline it and highlight it. Look at his question. He said, sirs, What must, and notice this first, I do. What is it that I must accomplish? What what list do I need to complete? Remember, he's fiercely loyal. He's committed. He's a dedicated man. Tell me what I need to do. What training do I need to go through? What accomplishments do I need? What do I need to pick up? What do I need to put down? What do I do? What do I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? What a brilliant question. It's a question that some of you have asked at a point in your life. It's it's a question I've asked. It's a question some of you have never asked, but you need to. What must I do to be saved? And I I love Paul's answer because it has a powerful precision. Look at it. So they said, do what? Believe. And the Lord Jesus Christ, and what? You will be saved. 
Roman jailer, you don't have to do, there's no action required. There's nothing you bring to the table. There's nothing you need to pick up or let down. Believe. And that belief is the most beautiful and glorious step you could ever take. And it's also the hardest because it's, it's an admission that you are broken and in need of a Savior, but it's also an admission that you can't bring anything into that moment to help. So it's like a weakness. It's, it's a struggle that's so beautiful and what you desperately need to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. He did what he said he could do for you. That Paul in another place would write, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's nothing that we have to do. It's just believe that it's already done. And so the Roman jailer, if you go on to read, believes in his entire household, believes, and they're all baptized. <laughs> These three stories Luke weaves together is this powerful picture of how unstoppable the gospel is because this is how the church at Philippi begins. This is the church that Paul writes the letter to in Philippians. If you love reading the book of Philippians, these are the people that he's writing to and perhaps are on his heart when he's pinning that book. You've got this wealthy Asian woman, perhaps a demon-possessed Greek slave girl, and a Roman jailer. It's a beautiful picture of how the gospel changes people from all ethnicities and backgrounds and socioeconomic statuses. Well, one author said it this way. He says, look at what the gospel does. He says, quote, it not only rescues unholy people and connects them to an unholy God, excuse me, to a holy God. Let me start over. I messed that up. It not only rescues unholy people and connects them to a holy God, but it takes people who would never do life together and make some family, end quote. Isn't that good? It's because the gospel is unstoppable. You've got to get 2023 out of your head. There was nothing in this first century world that would have allowed these people's lives to intersect. In fact, the social barriers and societal norms were so significant, it would have kept their lives very, very, very far apart. That there's nothing in man's power that could have put their lives together with a common person, purpose and a common bond, but enter the gospel. And not only did the gospel apply to each of their lives, wealthy woman, you, you still need more than that. You need Jesus, yes. Demonic oppression, freed and liberated. Fiercely committed, hardworking guy, but your hard work's not gonna get you into the kingdom of God. You still need Jesus. And it not only saved each one of them, I believe, but put their lives together in such a way that the body of Christ gives you a picture that nothing else can. It's beautiful. And so th there's two questions really that I have for you that I want you to consider as we, we wrap up our time together. One. Have you ever really wrestled with the Roman jailer's question? Like maybe you've come to church for a long time. But have you ever wrestled with the question, what must I do to be saved? I remember, man, 27 years ago, sitting in the balcony of a church, gripped with that question. What must I do? Paul and them answered. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There's no effort or work, no story too broken, no messy, complex issue that Jesus can't deal with. Believe, and today I would invite you to believe. There's a card in the seat back in front of you. Take it out. Put on that card, I want to follow Jesus today, and I'm going to reach out to you. We want to celebrate and walk through the greatest decision of your life. So I want you to consider that. That's one. Two, for those of you that belong to Jesus, when you read the rapid expansion 
of the gospel in the early church and you see how the gospel is unstoppable. I want you to ask yourself, like, where are you trapped in fear? Where are you sitting back and have stopped believing in the power of God? Where have you stopped believing that Jesus can actually do what he said he would do? And, and you know, yeah, I love Jesus and I follow Jesus and he's my king, but maybe it's a little bit stoppable. Maybe you've got a sin habit you can't break and you're working on it and you know you belong to Jesus, but you're like, I don't know if the gospel that saved me can break this. I don't know. But where have you stopped believing in the power of the gospel in your life and for your future? So I want you to stand. We're going to give you some time to reflect on both of those. If you, if you haven't wrestled with the question, what do I need to do to be saved? Then right now, in this moment, Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Believe. Grab that card. Fill it out. And if you're confident in that, then where? Where do you need a little more faith? Where do you need to experience the power of the gospel in your life? So open your hands to heaven. Posture yourself in a place of receiving We're going to give you the next 90 seconds, you and the Lord.